Hello everyone. Uh, today we're going to be talking a bit about nutrition as a microbe. I know uh, for me specifically I'm a big fan of eating. So uh, this is obviously very important for these microbes because it tells us how they get their energy um, and how they are able to survive in the environments that they're able to survive in. Uh, thus touching on their niche and where they can occur and what role they will be playing. So just a quick reminder about microbial nutrition. Um, this is a little flashcard that you can use for studying for exams. I found it quite useful, just reminding you that nutrients are typically divided into two groups, macronutrients and micronutrients. So starting off with what is a nutrient? So a nutrient is any substance in the environment that is used by organism, organisms during catabolism and anabolism. So macronutrients are obviously by, as the name implies, are required in large amounts. And these include carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus. Um, then also potassium, calcium, magnesium, and iron. You can see here on this slide where they, the functions that these um, respective nutrients will, uh, are, are used for. Um, and then moving on to micronutrients. So these nutrients are usually required in trace or smaller amounts. Um, then these are typically like, uh, you can think of a lot of your uh, metals like iron, copper, molybdenum, molybdenum zinc. Uh, so yeah, like I said, they're referred to as trace elements and they're mostly used um, uh, by certain enzymes. They're used as cofactors. Uh, so these can be, um, also then be utilized by microbes to uh, get the nutrients they need. So how do we classify these organisms then? So first let's, let's look at a couple of definitions here. Um, first, we're gonna be looking at, we're gonna divide organisms based on what they use as a carbon source. These will allow us to, um, to separate the organisms uh, rather efficiently. So we will be referring to um, organisms that use organic matter as a carbon source specifically, as a heterotroph or an organotroph, most, most commonly though as a heterotroph. And if they use an inorganic carbon source, um, this can be anything like CO2, for example, they will be classified as an autotroph um, or a lithotroph. Lithotroph, uh, the litho, as you might expect, refers to rock um, or earth. And in this case, um, the autotroph here just means automatic. So if you can think of something using carbon dioxide that's freely available in the atmosphere, it can just use that carbon as a source, um, appearing as if it's doing it automatically. Um, just so boiling down to the original, I, I always found from, uh, for my own purposes that studying is easier when I understand the base where the words come from. So troph means nutrition. It, it can also mean food um, and then uh, uh, hetero means other. So this would be other food or other, um, other nutrition and litho, as I said, means rock or earth. Then we can also separate these organisms based on the type of energy source they use. Keep in mind that this is different than the carbon source. So energy sources can be one of two things. You can either have chemical energy. So this is energy that you will obtain from the breakdown of material. So in, in our example, you know, using humans or animals as an example, we eat organic matter and the breakdown of that organic matter supplies us with energy. And then you can also use light as an energy, think plants. Um, these are called phototrophs. And this photo just means light and they use light then as an energy source. So the trophic structure of an ecosystem is sort of similar to the concept of a food web um, in, in, in the way it appears at least. Um, and in, then just, I thought it'd be pertinent to mention, uh, I mentioned that the inorganic carbon source can be CO2, but another common one can be CH4 or methane um, and they're considerable mineral carbon. Okay, so this is what that classification scheme looks like if you were to draw it out as a dichotomous key. So a dichotomous key is a tool that allows us to determine the identity of items in, in the natural world, such as trees, uh, mammals, reptiles, uh, rocks, and even fish. Um, and in this case, this nutritional system allows us to look at what energy source is used by the organism, which will then allow us to divide the organisms into chemotrophs and phototrophs. And then furthermore, what carbon source is used by the 
organisms allowing us to uh, divide them further into chemoheterotrophs. So this would be the chemo um, in the name refers to the chemical uh, energy source. See from over there, that gives us the chemo um, prefix. And then the heterotrophs means the uh, carbon sources organic compounds. So the hetero comes from that and then trophs, as I said, is food. So the name describes uh, to you exactly um, where it comes from. So if you were to look at plants, for example, they are photoautotrophs, meaning their energy source is, a li is light and then their carbon source is CO2. So then you arrive at photoautotrophs. We'll be discussing these in more detail a bit um, during this lecture. So uh, firstly, we'll be looking at chemoheterotrophs. So again, just as a reminder, these are organisms that use um, their energy source or chemical uh, they have a chemical energy source, so they break down um, uh, uh, matter. This can be uh, for energy. And then um, they also use organic matter as a carbon source. So uh, looking at chemoheterotrophs, so all the organisms that live on our bodies are chemoheterotrophs. They consume organic matter for energy uh, and carbon. Um, so these... Uh, Actually, you would find that most bacteria and fungi are actually chemoheterotrophs. Remember that fungi, although they look sort of like plants or they can have plant-like structures, they are not plants and they cannot photosynthesize, thus they cannot be um, uh, phototrophs. So a chemoheterotroph, just again as a reminder, is the term for an organism which derives its energy from chemicals, so it needs to consume other organisms to live. And that means um, in, in this case where the microbes uh, uh, are inside your body um, or you even yourself, it means you get, get your energy from food and that you must con consume other organisms such as plants or animals to survive. Okay, relatively straightforward, I think. Moving on to something that's maybe a little less straightforward because it's an example that we might not think of often, chemoautotrophs. So again, going down our key, we will see these are organisms that use chemical, uh, have a chemical energy source and that have a, uh, uh, see that use CO2 as a carbon source or has a, a inorganic carbon source. Um, so these are, are some strange concepts to us because we, uh, we don't fall into this category. Um, so here we can uh, look at, um, so ammonium oxidizing archaea, Remember that when you think archaea, uh, you can think of um, extremophiles oftentimes. And then, uh, so the, this organism, this, this archaea, um, then, then derives its energy from the oxidation of inorganic compounds. Um, and this, this uh, ammonium oxidizing archaea are very common in soil and they, commit, uh, they, they convert ammonium to nitrate. So they're very relevant to agriculture. As you know, your nitrate content of your soils will determine what you can and cannot plant there. Um, and then you can, just as a, as a reminder for the, uh, the, the um, extremophile nature of these things, look that most chemoautotroph bacteria, because bacteria can also be chemoautotrophs, live in hostile environments is the deep sea vents. Remember the extreme temperatures that, re that, that reached in this type of an environment and the fact that light cannot penetrate, uh, sunlight cannot penetrate down deep enough to reach this area. So this is a very, very hostile environment from our perspective. I mean, it's of course all rel relative for, for, for them. We live in a hostile environment, um, but we'll get to that when we discuss more on the ecology of microbes. But yeah, so, um, that's an example of where you could find organisms such as that, that are chemoautotrophs would be in these deep sea vent systems. So moving on to another uh, strange uh, concept, at least to me, uh, I've always had, had the most, most difficulty imagining these organisms as a student. So here we move now on to photoheterotrophs. So again, running down the, the key, sorry, I know you guys might get sick of this, but it really does help. It does help you, under, you have to understand these concepts because in exams and in future, if you continue your study, 
if someone talks about a chemo autotrophy, you have to know what it is. If they talk about a photo heterotrophy, you have to know what it is. And, and visualizing this graphic uh, in your mind is very, very helpful. Um, for purposes of exams and just your own knowledge, I'd actually advise that you draw out this, this diagram uh, just to commit it, to really commit it to memory. It's really, really helpful if you are planning on furthering your studies in the microbial field. Um, anyway, tangent aside, going back to photoheterotrophs. So here we have an organism that uses light as an energy source, hence the photo portion of the name. And then it uses organic compounds as a carbon source, hence the hetero portion of the name. So it uses light for energy and organic compounds for carbon. So this, why I always have difficulty imagining this organisms is because it's not something you commonly think of. Um, so what types of organisms are these? So your, your uh, green non-sulfur bacteria and purple non-sulfur bacteria are typically are typical examples of this. Again, energy, they derive from light and then the carbon they get from organic matter. Um, but these organisms are unable to convert carbon dioxide into a sugar. So they have to use organic compounds such as alcohols and fatty acids. And most of these organisms are then anaer or, uh, anaer anaerobic, meaning they cannot grow in the presence of oxygen. They need an absence of oxygen in order to grow. Okay, now moving on to another, maybe an easier example, um, being photoautotrophs, because they are organisms that make their own energy using light and carbon dioxide via the process of photosynthesis. Um, so here we have just running down the key again, our energy source is light <clears throat> and our carbon source is then carbon dioxide. So it's an inorganic carbon source. Most e the, or the easiest example to think of here is, of course, all, all of the plants. Uh, in this image here, we have a cyanobacteria. This was also uh, mistakenly first called blue-green algae, but it's not an algae, it is a bacteria. Um, and then all other algae are also uh, 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 examples of photoautotrophs. Um, just as a quick reminder here again, algae do, are not classified as plants. They are classified as plant-like, so they have certain commonalities with plants, but they also lack the organisms and the structures needed to be classified as full-on plants. So that's an important distinction, and it may or may not appear on the exam because it is something to important. It's an important distinction to make, and um, it's something that's pretty easy to forget. So, by means of a quick recap here, photoautotrophs. The energy source is light drawn by my, this little sun that I found over here. And then their carbon source is carbon dioxide. You can see your carbon dioxide molecules. And an example here would be obviously, as we just discussed, would be plants. And then chemoautotrophs or chemolithoautotrophs. Remember the litho means rock. So their energy is from inorganic um, chemicals. So that's either the carbon dioxide or if they're a litho, um, they can derive their energy from the breakdown of rock. And then their carbon source um, would be the CO2. Um, yeah, like I said, the energy will be break, will be uh, taken from, from uh, inorganic chemicals. So that's where your rock is and then your carbon CO2. And then photoheterotrophs, energy source is light and your carbon source are simple organic mo molecules. So this, this is where you uh, uh, have your, your sulfur bacteria, your non-sulfur bacteria. And then chemoheterotrophs, their energy is an organic and their carbon source is also organic. So think of most animals. When you think about this, including us, we are also classified as chemoheterotrophs because we eat food and that is how we obtain both our carbon and our energy. So moving on to our nutrition, um, Remember, we spoke about macro and micronutrients at the start of the lecture, gave you a quick little breakdown of those. Something that you can use is this little moniker, C. Hopkins Cafe managed by mine cousins, Mo and Claude. This gives you a breakdown of your um, elemental requirements where uh, your, your uh, just, just keep in mind here that these include some trace metals. So your trace metals as a, as a, a reminder here, that MN you see over there is manganese, ZN is zinc, 
uh, CU is copper, CO is cobalt, um, and then MO is molybdenum. And then these, these uh, microbes also often just need a little bit of sodium in their, uh, to, in order to grow um, optimally. And uh, as, I, as I said, this will get us now to, to moving on to our environmental conditions, specifically oxygen. We will be discussing uh, on the next slide, what are obligate anaerobes, what are obligate anaerobes, what are facultative anaerobes, and what are aerotolerant anaerobes and microaerophiles. Um, I just want you to guys to just please read about the toxic forms of oxygen and what these do to organisms. Um, I won't be discussing that in great depth today. Following that, we will also be discussing the effects of temperature, pH, and then some other sources of the environmental conditions and their impact on microbial growth and nutrition and cultivation. So this is going to be a, a bit of a longer slide. I apologize for that, but it's a really important one. So as you can see here, this is a breakdown of the impact of oxygen on microbes. Um, so if you seal uh, microbes in a, in a vial like this with a, you know, sort of halfway filled with, with liquid, you will find that only obviously the top portion will have um, oxygen in it. And this is where we have, uh, we have to think about where these microbes come from or what their evolutionary history is. So remember for a long time, especially in the early earth, of course, there was no oxygen and oxygen oxygen didn't like really become a major component of our atmosphere until photosynthesis evolved uh, and thus some organisms just never evolved to deal with it they never uh, they they were originally never required to to deal with this gas um, in the atmosphere so firstly we'll be looking at obligate anaerobes and why these um, um, organisms so in this vial the organisms are obligate anaerobes and their position within the vial will tell you what type of organisms they actually are so if the organisms in your in your vial are um, obligate anaerobes they need oxygen because they cannot ferment or respire or um, respire anaerobically so thus they will gather at the top of the tube where the oxygen concentration is the greatest there's the most amount of oxygen here and they need that to live so obviously the organisms will be in the greatest concentration here and next moving on to facultative anaerobes so the word facultative means like capable you can think of it as capable of dealing with so they can grow with or without oxygen but really important here they can, uh, so they can metabolize energy aerobically or anaerobically, but they gather mostly at the top. And what would the reason for this be? That is because that the, the um, respiration generates more ATP in the presence of oxygen than in the absence of oxygen. So uh, aerobic respiration will generate more ATP than either fermentation or anaerobic respiration. And organisms want to be as efficient as possible, especially when it comes to energy. So they will gather where there will be a greater concentration of them where they, um, where they are able to just gain energy the most efficiently. But there will still be some organisms down lower in the tube because they are able to survive and, um, and, and, and um, continue thriving. Uh, under anaerobic conditions, so in the absence of oxygen. Then moving on to ab obligate anaerobes. So obligate anaerobes, obligate means like it's an obligation, you have to do it, it is, it, it's, it's not an optional. Um, and so an obligate anaerobe means it has to be under anaerobic conditions, so it, ha it, it requires the absence of oxygen. So these organisms are actually poisoned by oxygen. Thus, they gather at the lowest um, portion, at the bottom of the tube, where the oxygen concentration is the lowest. And then they will be able to just ferment or anaerobically respirate. Then aerotolerant anaerobes. These oxygens do not like oxygen, as they can, met, uh, as they can metabolize energy, energy um, anaerobically. However, unlike obligate anaerobes, they are not poisoned by oxygen. So they are not poisoned by oxygen in the same way as these organisms are. 
and then thus these organisms are sort of spread out um, throughout the, the tube. There's almost an even distribution of them. Um, and then a micro aerophile, as the as the name suggests, micro meaning small, and uh, so it needs small amounts of oxygen. So micro aerophiles need oxygen because they cannot ferment or aspire anaerobically, so they cannot do it in the absence of oxygen. However, they are poisoned by high amounts of oxygen, by high concentrations of oxygen. So they sort of need that happy medium where they have the amount they need, but not so much that it's actually harmful for them. Thus, they will sort of accumulate in the middle of the uh, uh, test tube or, uh, you know, um, but not too close to the top. Okay. So now moving on to temperature. Um, the, the most important thing that you, you have to think of of temperature, this goes back to some basic chemistry. On a molecular level, what does heat do? Think about it for a second and that most of that should be pretty simple. I, I expect you guys to know this is that on a molecular level, temperature makes molecules move. move like higher temperatures will you find greater vibration and movement of your molecules. So and then some breakdowns here of, of, of what you need to know. Philic again, just as a reminder, um, when we're talking about a, a a thermophile, that file, that philic means it is something that loves um, something else. So a thermophile is something that loves heat. Um, and then uh, uh, here there is there are quite a few interesting things of how we we separate organisms into different groups based on their temperature requirements. The temperature is here represented on the x-axis and the rate of growth on the y-axis. So starting from the left, you first have your psychrophiles, these organisms, psychro here meaning cold, um, and psychrophiles can live in place that no other organisms can survive. So like these organisms are found, for example, in Antarctica, um, and there are no other plants and animals that live where these organisms live because they prefer extreme cold. So from minus 10 degrees Celsius to I mean, their optimal growth temperature is, is just around about by 10 degrees Celsius, maybe a bit warmer, like 12, 13 degrees Celsius. Um, then you move on to your psychotrophs. Psychotrophs, these are organisms that will grow in your fridge. So think of something like a mold that grows on a, a piece of fruit you leave in your fridge for too long. These are psychotrophs. They also prefer temperatures on the more colder, colder side of the spectrum. Mesophiles, these organisms sort of re refer to your middle temperatures. They're the most common organisms and most often than not, these are also the organisms that are very harmful to, to us. Because um, if you think of what your body temperature is, so the, the body temperature should be about 37 to 37.5 degrees Celsius, just as a reminder, which is right about slam bang where these organisms like to grow. So you think about again, what, what, what the temperature will do if you have an organism that is adapted to colder temperatures, if it is now uh, suddenly exposed to this temperature, such as in your body, it's not likely to do anything because your, your, your body heat will not be optimal for the organism to survive in and it'll die. Same for um, thermophiles or hyperthermophiles, so these extremophile organisms, um, your body temperature will be too cold for them to actually live in. So most of your disease causing microbes are found in this group. Um, of mesophiles. And they are also, because globally temperatures in this range are more common, um, the, this, this group uh, is the most common group of microorganisms found on the planet. Okay. So, and then we move on to your thermophiles and hyperthermophiles by the very you know definition of what a thermophile is. You can already guess that these organisms really like hot environments. Think like hot springs or those hydrothermal vents that we keep referring back to. Um, so these organisms also survive where other uh, forms of life just cannot because it is just simply so warm. Um, again, remember as I, when I started the slide referring to what does heat do, these organisms have adaptations that allow them, them and their uh, structures that they need inside of themselves to survive this heat and not to just you know be dissipated or or, or be be destroyed by the heat 
Um, one specific problem um, is, is with protein de denaturation, and these organisms can combat that. They've evolved in such a way that they can combat that and still maintain their proteins, keep them intact under these extremely high temperatures. So here's a nice example um, of an extremophile uh, looking at Thermus aquaticus, um, aquaticus, sorry. This is uh, an important organism because this is where we get TAC polymerase from. And TAC polymerase is really, really important for any um, form of PCR work. So just a bit of a breakdown here. This polymerase, polymerase enzyme does, do, does not denature. Remember enzymes, is a, uh, enzymes are required for chemical reactions to take place. They, they um, help um, them to occur. So this polymerase enzyme does not denature at high temperatures. So this protein uh, doesn't break down. And uh, these organ this organism was first found in Yellowstone National Park. And it has this, this heat stable enzyme uh, called TAC polymerase. Um, and this is uh, this permitted the, the, the or permitted the invention of um, PCR, which is polymerase chain reaction, which has just revolutionized biotechnology. I'm not going to go into too much PCR detail, so feel free to read on that. But in the last couple of decades, it's been the at the forefront of all microbial research, including my um, inclu including environmental microbiology, and um, it relies on this enzyme that is stable at this extreme temperature. Okay. Looking at pH, um, specifically soil pH here. So this is from a really, really um, well-known article by F uh, Firer and Jackson that was written in 2006. This, this, uh, uh, and their article found some interesting things and a few major discoveries. One is that pH is a major driver of soil bacterial diversity. Um, they found that in soils across all the globe, um, and yeah, they, they found that to be true for soils all across the glo globe in different ecosystem ecosystems. pH was the major driver of bacterial diversity. Uh, this means that most organisms that live in soil prefer a neutral pH and less and less organisms can survive at lower pHs. And this boils down to the fact that these cells need to maintain an internal pH that allow their enzymes to function. So thinking back to the temperature slides we just discussed, if those uh, enzymes denature or they are harmed by the pH, they will cease function uh, and thus their entire, the, the, the organism's entire energy production system will just shut down and it will die. So moving on to a more local example, this is actually from some of the work that I've done um, and from, from my lab, uh, from Prof. Hubbard's lab, um, the Institute for the Institute of Water Security and Science and the Interdisciplinary Hydrology Lab here at WVU. So this uh, is a, a image, um, a graphical abstract from one of our articles that's currently uh, being reviewed. And this represents West Run Watershed, where we have 22 sampling locations that we sample for both E. coli and um, Enterococcus, Enterococci. And that what we found is the headwaters of this West Run watershed is heavily impacted by acid mine drainage, so AMD. So this means that in these area, this area, this portion of the watershed, you have acidic conditions, you have lower pH. And what we found is that in this portion of the watershed, you thus have decreased fecal bacteria and increased uh, and decreased fecal. Uh, indicator back diversity, specifically the enterococci populations in this portion of the watershed were being suppressed, were really being heavily affected. The E. coli organisms were also being suppressed, but they seem to be a bit more resistant to the lower pHs than the enterococci was. And then as you move to the lower portions of the watershed, you found this increase in fecal bacteria. So our, our um, E. coli concentrations over here was, were higher, indicating higher amounts of fecal pollution. And then also you found increased fecal indicator diversity. You found both more higher populations of enterococci and E. coli here than, uh, as I said, at the top of the water chief, I sort of only found the E. coli. Um, just there, there are some other reasons for this too. Uh, if you look at uh, some of the land use practices here, you can find that um, 
there's a lot of agricultural uh, land use practices in this area of the watershed that would also lead to increased fecal contamination, but the pH showed significant impact on these um, uh, fecal indicator bacteria. And uh, yeah, this, this, this is a, a pretty interesting finding because it shows you that, you know, mining that had ceased in the 1970s, even before that 1960s, the impacts are, of those practices are still being felt by the microbial communities in the streams. And it's still driving microbial diversity, even years and years and years after the mining had actually stopped. So now, what can what what can pH be be used for now that we know the type of impact it can have on the suppression of microbes? So one of the first ones that obviously comes to mind is in food preservation. So most organisms cannot survive in a pH below four. So um, thus, we've started using pickled foods that have a pH of like 4.6 or lower. I think of something also like kimchi is also something that uses pH to preserve the, the, the food. Um, and then many of these fermented foods are preserved by acids that are actually produced from uh, bacterial metabolism. <clears throat> okay, moving on to a halo file. So what is halo here? Not the not the nice, uh, you know, the fun game that we haven't had a good one from in a while. This is actually, it refers to salt. Um, so halo is actually the, the, the Latin word for salt. It uh, also explains why you find so many angry, you know, teenagers and kids playing that game. It's a lot of salt. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, so salt, obviously, as we discussed in one of our previous lectures, if you think about how that will drive the, the, the diffusion of water and the movement of water into and more specifically out of a cell, um, if you have a, a, a very saline environment or a, a very salty environment, you will have water moving out of the cell and the cell actually dying because it just loses all its water, it can't retain its water. So if you have something like Halobacteria uh, selenarium, you find that these organisms have to be able to retain their water by uh, to survive in these extremely extremely salty conditions. Um, <clears throat> so you you might then naturally ask the question, why do I have this little dancing flamingo and this 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 picture of a flamingo? This boils down to the question of why are these flamingos pink? I wonder if any of you know this. Well, if you did, congratulations. But I'm going to tell you now what it's. So these, uh, these, these um, flamingos are pink because um, for a few reasons, but one of the, one of it is that the reason, one of the reasons is that the microbe um, that was named microbe of the year in 2017, this was this Halobacterium selenarum, <clears throat> it gives the, the flamingo its pink color. And here is how that works. So, um, <clears throat> This uh, this this uh, bacteria, um, and and it, it can actually reproduce in mass, and uh, it has high salt salt contents and extreme. Um, so the high salt contents and extreme UV radiation uh, don't bother this organism um, because it's a halophile. It likes being in salt environments. So especially as so as a survival artist, this organism developed a range of special adaptation mechanisms by adjusting the salt content to that of the water. So think of, of what this microbe is actually able to do. It's able to, to maintain a salt concentration inside the cell that is similar to the salt concentration outside. Thus, it doesn't lose all its water. This is insane. This is really interesting. And this bacteria also possesses a red pigment, which is called bacteria ruberin, which is a type of carotenoid, a carotenoid, which protects the DNA um, from the, the radiation that it's exposed to because it lives in these, these salt lakes. And this, then what happens is that the brine shrimp that also live in these ecosystems eat this halobacterium. And then the, the flamingo comes and it eats the brine shrimp. And this pigment is essentially concentrated you know, up the food chain. It's a form of a, a bioconcentration. And thus the flamingos appear pink. Yeah, little, little fun fact for you there. Okay, so now moving on 
to the cultivation of uh, bacteria. As you can imagine now that we've discussed all the, the diverse range of conditions that these microbes can live in, it's important for us to know those so that when we want to cultivate these organisms that we can provide them with a, a uh, environment in which they can actually thrive and survive. So that can, brings us to medium, uh, to media and medium. So here, just medium is the correct singular term and media is the correct plural term. So a medium is something that allows other things to, to move through in a, in, in, a microbiolo in, a, in a context of microbiology, it is a liquid or gel that is designed to support the growth of bacterial culture. So we'll be discussing some, some synthetic complex uh, media, and then we'll be looking at the other ways to classify the media, um, and then we'll be looking at solidification. So moving on to culture media, um, there are the, you can define them, <laughs> funny. you can separate them into two groups, chemically defined media or complex media, where in a chemically defined media, the exact chemical, uh, the exact chemical composition is known. Um, this is typically used when you want to test growth requirements for an organism. Um, so for example, for a chemo heterotroph, the chemically defined medium must contain organic growth factors that serve as a source of carbon and energy. And you can then um, alter these, uh, these conditions and see what the organism is capable of surviving in and how it affects its growth. Um, and then complex media, this, this uh, typically used, used for the, you know, extracts and digests of yeast or, or comprise, sorry, these things are made out of extracts of, uh, and digests of yeasts, meat and plants. Think of something like nutrient broth or nutrient agar. Uh, complex media is most commonly used for routine growth and isolation of organisms. You guys will be working with them in the lab. So <laughs> over here, um, don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to, to parrot this back to me in an exam or something. I just wanted to, to show you what the breakdown is of a chemically defined medium for the growth of a, a fastidious chemo -heter -heter -hetero chemo heterotrophic, which you must know what that means by now bacterium such as Neisseria gonorrhea. So this is what this chemically defined media looks like. This is what the, it, its exact contents. So um, a lot of organisms, especially those that live on a host, um, have lost the ability to synthesize amino acids and growth factors they need to survive. Thus these growth, fact, growth factors are similar to our need for vitamins. Um, I mean, it's something that we need, but we cannot make ourselves. Um, and then, so when you're making a chemically defined media for an organism like this Neisseria gonorrhea, um, which but as its name suggests causes gonorrhea, you need to include a lot of ingredients for it to have what it needs to grow. So you're essentially giving the organism everything it needs. And thus, uh, that's why it's such a long list of stuff on in, in very precise quantities. So now we are looking at a, what is called a, a, a complex medium. Um, this is for specifically for the growth, for growth of a heterotrophic bacteria. And so this, this would obviously bring up the question of, hang on, but why is this called a complex media if it only has five ingredients? So um, it may seem simpler than the chemically defined media but, that you looked at, but there are less ingredients. Um, but each of these have really, really um, many, many compounds. If you think of, of the, the, the breakdown of the beef extract and the parsley digested protein. So all of this is actually very complex. This is just a very simplified look at what it is. Um, so for example, there will be amino acids included in the peptone um, and the vitamins and polysaccharides and nucleic acids and basically everything that makes up a cell is included in there. So it's, it is actually more complex. It just seems simple um, because it's, we're not giving you all the details. So please don't uh, for a second, think that complex media has a weird, you know, uh, non-descriptive name. Okay, now moving on to selective media. And by the uh, uh, name, you might guess that this media can be used to select for certain organisms. So essentially this media will suppress unwanted microbes and encourage the growth of the desired microbes. So if you look at something like 
used in methylene blue, also, in a, also called EMB or Levine's formulation. It's a selective stain for gram negative bacteria. And EMB contains dyes that are toxic for gram positive bacteria. So it, 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 it suppresses the gram positive bacteria. And then it has bile salt, which is toxic for gram negative bacteria and other coliforms. So um, it, it, it suppresses the undesired organisms in that manner. So you can only select what you are looking for. Um, uh, because it's, it's toxic for gram-negative bacteria other than coliforms. Sorry, I should have completed that sentence. So it'll suppress gram-positive bacteria um, by the EMB, by, by the dyes it contains, and then it'll, supp it'll suppress the gram-negative bacteria that are not coliforms um, through a bile, a bile salt. Um, so essentially, you will be select when using this media, you're selecting and isolating um, not isolating, but you're selecting for coliform bacteria. And coliform, just um, as, as a means of definition, they're defined as uh, rod shaped gram negative non spore formulating and motile, both motile and non motile bacteria, which can ferment lactose with the production of acid and gas when incubated at 35 to 37 degrees Celsius. So, uh, a common example of this is just E. coli. Um, now we go and look at differential media. This make it, again, as the names are pretty descriptive here, it makes it easy to distinguish different microbes and microbial attributes. Uh, so they differentiate them based on, for example, lactose fermentation. So it turns pink when lactic acid is, is, is present. So here, um, this, this test was lactose positive, this, the, the microbe was E. coli, and it produced, um, or it fermented the, the uh, other side, sorry, I lost my, my pointer. Here we go. In this case, you have blue white screening uh, for cloning. Um, so it has beta -galac galatinosidase, you don't have to know that name, which interrupts plas uh, plasmid um, and synthesizes um, beta galactosidase, um, which then gives you the differentiation between the blue and the white. And then there's also something called an enrichment culture, which is similar to a, a selective media, but it's designed to increase the number of desired microbes to detectable levels. Please read more about this in the text. Um, it's it's not a it's not really that tricky um, because it's simply done to increase the numbers uh, to detectable levels. So it's not uh, really that complex. Um, so now we're going to be talking a bit about solidification of gelatin. So gelatin uh, is what jello is made of. It's a collagen um, and it's boiled animal cartilage. And it can be used as a medium in microbiology, but agar is really, you know, preferred. It's really easier and better. So agar is like a vegetarian version of gelatin. Um, you can always think of it that way because it was originally discovered in seaweed but it is present in many marine plants and most commonly extracted actually from algae. Um, so yeah, that's what the media are made from. So the, looking at what agar is, agar is actually just a complex polysaccharide and it's complex enough that most microbes cannot you know, break it down. And it is used as a, uh, as, yeah, as I said, can't be metabolized or broken down by microbes and it is used as, as a solidification agent for culture media and PG place plants and, and, and deep. So those of you who are attending the, the labs will be working with agar quite a lot. And agar liquefies at 100 degrees Celsius and it uh, solidifies um, at the 43 degrees Celsius, more or less. So now we're gonna be talking quickly about pure culture methods. Please read the discussion in text because it will provide much more details than I will in, in, in this discussion and is really important. Um, so there are quite a few methods you can use here. There's street plate, spread plate, and pour plate methods. Um, and this is essentially what it will, will look like um, when you're doing it correctly. See how the, the number of microbes will be decreasing to singular colonies, um, which will then hopefully be pure colonies, uh, or yeah, will be then be a colony of a single organism, so you've isolated it. Um, and then the, the, the question between pore plate and spread plate, like I said, please read this, this in your texts. Um, 
But the main difference that I want you to be aware of between pour plate and spread plate is that the molten agar is poured onto the inoculum during the preparation of the pour plate, whereas the inoculum is spread on the surface of the solidified agar during the preparation of the spread plate. So just pouring the agar versus spreading the micro. Hence, pour plate and spread plate. And then something that is uh, very, very commonly done, street plating. This is also what you can do to isolate bacterial colonies. So um, we have discussed this, but I will, will, will quickly go over it again. So you will take your, your inoculation loop and you will streak across the plate and then you will um, sterilize it. And then you will start without taking more from the original sample. You will start and streak across that, making sure to intersect with the, your original streaks. So you'll start there, streak, 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 sterilize, come back, and then streak, 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 and then sterilize and come back and you'll again, make sure to go across them and then streak it out. And then this is what it looks like. So there you can see this was representative number one over there. So that was your init initial um, streaks. And then they sterilize and they streak this and you can see the, the colonies being less and less. Um, and then they streak like this for the final one. And thus you find isolated bacteria of two different types. You can see here is the, uh, the red and then the yellow or whitish almost. Um, and this is how you isolate pure cult bacterial cultures. Um, and then how do you maintain or preserve your culture? So first you can uh, get stock culture collections from the American type culture collection. And then there are four, uh, main methods of preservation. This is where you periodically transfer it to a fresh medium. Uh, you can overlay it with a mineral oil or you can store the microbes at very low temperature. Remember the effect of temperature. At lower temperatures, chemical reactions get slowed down because you have less molecular movement. So this will also preserve the microbes because they will be um, less likely to expire because you're, you're essentially keeping them in place. Or you can think of it as keeping them, pausing them for a bit. And then you also had lyophilization, uh, and that is essentially called is, uh, is, is essentially like freeze drying, um, and and it's a method of drying that significantly reduces um, the damage to the organisms. Okay, then quickly going to be going over a couple of review questions here. So first off, what what is the carbon and energy source for a chemo heterotroph? give you guys a couple of minutes here, a couple of minutes, sorry, a couple of seconds, uh, give you about five more seconds. Feel free to pause the video if you want to test yourself, if you need some more time. So chemo heterotroph. So remember the chemo heterotroph will have organic matter um, as a carbon source and chemical energy as a, as a, a, a energy source. So chemo heterotroph, think of that, that's like us. So you will eat uh, another organism, um, be it a plant or an animal, and through its breakdown, you will get both carbon and energy. So a chemo heterotroph is an example of what we are. So what is the carbon uh, and energy source for a photoautotroph? I'll give you a couple of seconds here. This one is really, really simple. Okay. And the answer, of course, here is CO2 and light. Think of plants here, photo meaning it gets its energy from light, and auto meaning it get, gets its carbon from CO2 or inorganic carbon source. So what are acceptable methods of preserving microbial cultures? I'm going to give you guys a couple of seconds here to think, is it periodic transfer to a fresh medium, overlay with mineral oil, storage at lower temperatures, Lyophilization or all of the above. Okay, let me give you. And the answer, of course, here is all of the above. Don't always assume that a question that has the response of all of the above will be incorrect. So, true or false, facultative anaerobes prefer to grow in the absence of oxygen. So, think carefully here. We discussed this at length. Think, think of those tubes and where these microbes were found. The answer, of course, here is false. Remember, although they are facultative anaerobes, it means they can survive in anaerobic conditions. 
aerobic respiration generates more ATP than either fermentation or anaerobic for, uh, respiration. Thus, if oxygen is available, these organisms will prefer to grow where there is oxygen. Okay. Okay, guys, um, that'll be it for our lecture today. I will uh, see you guys in the next one.